Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll be back. Too early. Too early. In German, we say Porsche's lobby. Genau. That was too early. Now, my Steam account f I have for one game I have on my laptop just popped up. Okay. So, guys, um, I have the honor of introducing a Linux container with a special focus on Docker um, for the persons who have been on the talk before at the VHP. Oh, what's happening? That's you. It's not you? It is. <laughs> Beach ball. Same shirt. No, different <laughs> one. <laughs> okay. But same shirt. Uh, <sighs> this guy. Yeah, something. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's a, this clicker thingy? No. It's old applications coming up. It's a very old laptop, though, for page two, maybe. Here we go. So, I have the, uh, I have the honor to um, yeah, give the introduction on Linux containers. Um, it's labeled Linux containers in a nutshell. It is mainly um, focused on Docker containers, but we'll also um, yeah, take a peek look what, what else there is around. So, for getting started, I'm the one keeping you from more dessert. Um, my name is Holger Ganteko. I studied um, general computer science um, in Furtwang, the only university in Germany with like two winter semesters. It's yeah, really cold there and it's in the Black Forest. And um, yeah, since then I'm working, um, since I finished my studies, I'm working as a senior systems engineer for an IT service company I'm gonna introduce briefly in a moment. And they work, uh, work with a team providing IT services uh, for customers um, in the field of automotive mainly. So we operate HPC environments there, um, not really top 500 scale at, le um, at least, but um, yeah, more, um, more a few hundred or, or thousand um, systems, not cores. So um, they are the engineers. The, uh, they are dealing um, with CAE applications. So mm -hmm. as I said, engineers. Furthermore, I'm a part-time research student at the Institute for Cloud Computing and IT Sicherheit back in Futwang. So if anybody should be interested in these topics, can get in contact with them. And the company I work for is Science and Computing. Um, we are around for like 25 years, a bit more now. And um, yeah, we were acquired by Bull once and um, due to this, we now belong to Atos. So this is probably gonna be one of the last talks I give as SNC because we will be rebranded. And um, our customers are mainly, as you can see, um, all over um, automotive all over Germany. So this is gonna be this soon. So don't worry, we're the same people, but um, just in case if anybody should be looking for a job, um, you can contact us here. And um, so enough of the commercial break. Um, what's <coughs> in about the talk? So um, first of all, we look what Docker is. Then um, why Docker matters for HPC. I talk a little bit um, of security and then um, show what, what happened um, yeah, nearly the last half year um, in, the, in the Docker community. And if we should have some time to spend, um, yeah, I might give a um, very brief getting started guide, but um, let's do things differently. I have a few questions, so please um, raise your hand. Um, who has heard of Docker? I guess everybody because you're here. Okay, um, who has a deeper understanding what Docker is? Okay, so at least a few people to yeah, grab you in the beginning. And who has actually tried Docker? Okay, the same guys. And um, who really uses Docker yet? Okay, and who does it use in production? Okay, it's, it's getting, yeah. And um, who's using additional tools? Okay, um, the, the reason behind this was um, to get an understanding of, of your background and um, where we should start and, and pick you up. So um, what is Darku? Um, I'm hoping it's gonna be a bit fun, um, uh, yeah, straight after lunch. So first of all, 
Um, Docker is sort of a hype topic um, for quite a while now, and um, there's currently no conference you can att attend um, without finding talks about it. Um, we had a workshop last year here at um, here, this very place, without me, but um, also on IEC Big Data and, and Cloud. And um, so even for this community, Docker is like a very huge thing. And um, for, for the rest of the world, um, it's, yeah, it's also a hot topic. It revived, uh, it revived the already considered um, debt of operating level virtualization um, on this later, and it has gotten very much of attention praised by excited users. Um, very creative ideas um, for some to speak, and yeah, also certain rants. So um, currently everybody wants to join the Docker Fun Club, um, even those traditional virtualizers um, like VMware and um, Zytrix um, added some features to the virtualization product. Um, so Docker is the place to be more or less. So what is Docker? Um, the web page used to describe it as an open platform to build, ship, and run distribution um, applications anywhere. They re, um, yeah, refigured, the, rebranded this to, to laptop data centers, VM, and the cloud. And um, what I really like about this is um, they say it's a platform. It's, it's, it's not just um, an engine of, of some kind to enabling you uh, to start up containers. So they having a, a vision of a platform here and um, yeah, you can use it anywhere. So, um, and for both developers and admin, um, which looks like, yeah, sort of a big promise. And it's nice for some memes and um, docker, 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 docker. Um, so let's get started with a very little Docker 101. Um, back in 2013, Docker was started as an application for isolating uh, applications and it uses operating level um, virtualization. Um, but at its very core, um, it's an application that simplifies the um, provisioning, um, transport, and isolation um, of used resources. Container A is meant to um, not be able to access what is inside container B by default. It uses kernel technologies um, that are C groups and, and namespaces at, at its very core, and it formerly used the LXC interface of the Linux kernel, um, but now they moved to their own lib container. It also offers tons of nice features I'm going to cover a few later. And um, as you can see, that's the very core. We have um, the namespaces. Several subsystems are at the moment namespace aware, and it's for providing this, uh, uh, yeah illusion uh, of running on your very own thing and then we have the control groups um, which limit resource uh, resource usage so brief docker history um, it was founded by a company in 2000 uh, called dot cloud back then that used pass with a custom container engine which was originally based in open vz so um, dating quite a while back then they switched to la uh, later to lxc and uh, it once started as a single Python script and became huge and huge and huge. And um, in 2012, they finally decided to refactor uh, it and rename it, codename it Docker, and it was written in Go. Um, it has gotten very positive reactions after PyCon 2013, I think, where it is, was initially introduced. And um, soon um, the company um, shifted their work from the path thing um, to just working on the Docker engine. and. Um, yeah, consequently we labeled themselves. So um, now it's not only these guys working on Docker's. If you take a look at um, what open source a Docker is about, you see only very small, yeah, rather a small fraction um, of uh, of the engine is actually maintained by, by Docker employees. So there's quite a lot of stuff coming in for, from other contributors. So um, as you can see, Docker is not just only pushed by, by one company, but by many. So very brief um, terminology, um, what Docker is about. So first of all, we have the core comp uh, components. We have the Docker host. This is the system um, your, your container is running on. Then we have the client. This is where you access the Docker daemon with. And um, yeah, these are the main core compo uh, components. If you want to use this with OS X and, and Windows, you usually have some sort of VM around it. At the moment, it's VirtualBox, um, but um, with a with beta um, of their, their new um, Windows and, and Linux uh, and Mac OS client, they're switching to, um, to native virtualizations there. So for Windows 10, um, it's Hyper-V, and the other one is 
something with hive, X hive. Um, right, so um, if we look at the workflow components, we have images which contain the applications and the environment you need to run the application. If you instantiate this, you have your running Docker container. Um, this is the thing you start and stop. You have a Docker registry, which is more or less an, an app store for images. Um, you can have this public and, and private, and then you have the Docker files, which, uh, which you use uh, for automating um, image build. So what can Docker do for you? Usually, people say, I start with this, saving lives. The traditional fight versus uh, developers and operating systems. And um, yeah, the, the traditional fight, it worked on my machine when I programmed it. Now it runs on your so uh, server and it's not working anymore. Um, where I come from, it's a bit different. I'm operating the skies and I usually don't have to deal with developers, but I have to deal with, um, with customers, um, which are um, engineers and um, they have requirements like this, isolating dependencies. Um, for example, they have like 2,000 versions of the same application um, running on the system and um, sometimes are running on, on rather uh, legacy applications of uh, uh, legacy versions of, of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and they want to um, run the latest and greatest applications and betas of, of the um, application they are using. And so um, another thing is when you have different applications on the same system updating one for example, here, uh, the libc might break on the one hand. Now, if you have Docker, you can isolate this, this in that way. You have your web server here, and it has all the library he needs, and you have this here, and um, it's just isolated, and um, you can update it on this side whenever you want, and it won't break this. So, um, yeah, the other nice thing is, this box around it, you have a um, you have a very portable entity you can you can share with others. So um, yeah, basically you can have the same container running on your laptop, your workstation, your cluster, the cloud. You get it. So um, not completely typical example. Um, what we use um, Docker in a customer environment for was this. Um, this is an example for how Docker um, came to the rescue of dependency. Um, yeah, dependency um, hell and how it was solved by Docker. Um, the, a colleague of mine was tasked to do the following. So the customer came along and said, okay, I have this special outdated license for MATLAB, um, which still works and I want to use it. Okay, this just works with this exact version of, of this vendor daemon. Um, so you need, for license, you need a vendor daemon, then you have, um, you have your FlexLM um, license server running around it. And it came down to a scenario where it was not possible to, to um, get it running in the same way on a, on a current machine. And um, yeah, just for proof of concept that it will work, um, we tried to, um, we, we, we containerized it and now it's running. And yeah, we have virtualized, containerized, virtualized licenses in this scenario. Um, I just brought up this slide um, or this diagram because we have all the nice, um, fancy um, elements we learned before. We have Docker files, we have here um, our, um, yeah, the different layers at this point. So um, what is also great is um, when you are in an environment um, like in certain scientific fields, um, you want to share um, you want to share your workflows you're dealing with. Um, at last year's workshop, we had um, a team from Tübingen there um, who was doing genomic research, uh, genomic sequencing, and they were telling us about okay, life before Docker um, just sucked because yeah, exaggerating a bit. Um, the point was they were working at their institute and they were wanting to 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 ship their whole. Um, processing pipeline. So they don't just have one application which is, which is doing something and is easily shareable. They have tons of or several uh, several applications you want to which are interlinked and they want to share it with, with different with different institutes. And the problem is um, getting this running at someplace else is usually um, quite stressful. So um, updating Python at this one point um, might break something else and um, Using this, um, containerizing this, and having this in an uh, in a, in a easable, shareable way is, is just great for them. So and this is just, um, yeah, something which is really great for, for, for researchers here. 
So another um, nice feature um, we have, you can um, have um, layered images. Um, so you can use your, your, reuse your base image, put different stuff on top of it and reuse it again. And um, this is in so far great because um, it makes the, the Docker Hub com at least a bit comparable um, to, to GitHub. So you can take someone else's work, base your work on it, and share this again with someone else, and he mm -hmm. then does something. And it's just nice for, for working together. So um, as I mentioned before, this is also something that makes Docker great, the ecosystem around it. So if you take a look at this, they are always good at running those things Docker style. We have tons of uh, tons of options now at the moment um, for orchestration. Um, for we have hosting options, and um, and so on and so forth. And um, so, Docker, Docker, Docker. That's what it reminded me of. So, um, yeah, Docker is is Docker now in some ways a magical virtual machine. Some people tend to see Docker this way, but that's not the way it is. Docker does not necessarily make anything better, faster, harder, and stronger and faster. Um, the thing is, if we take a look at containerization pipeline, um, the funny thing about this one is, um, this is the first thing you get when you when you Google um, container container history. It has nothing to do with the actual subject, um, but I, I think I think it gave a nice touch to it. Um, the thing is, if you take a look at the timeline. Um, I'm absolutely aware there are other virtualization options um, for Solaris and what else there is around, um, but um, for, the, for the x86 market, everything started with VMware um, back in 99 when they brought along um, VMware Workstation 0.0 and um, soon after this they had a server version. 2003 Xen came to light with this um, first initial release. Then um, soon after that, we have OpenVZ, which is also um, on the virtualization on the operating system level, still around. It's sort of dead because 2016, having to run a Frankenstein kernel on your system is not really some fun thing you want to do unless you really, really need it. There might be some people for this, but um, in general, you don't want to use this. So 2006, um, KVN came to light. So this is what people usually use when they are doing Linux virtualization. Um, what did pop up? Ah, you see LXC, another um, uh, virtualization um, technique. Um, yeah, not, not completely similar um, to Docker, but um, you see it's also around for quite a long time. And then 2008 also Open Nebula, one of the cloud management systems came along. OpenStack, the biggest and hugest and most complicated cloud management platform came along in 2010. And finally, we have Docker here in 2030. So the point I'm trying to make is, and then CoreOS. The point I'm making is, if you take a look back, um, virtualization is quite a long time. Virtualization at the operating system level is also quite a long time. So um, Docker is not something completely new. It's, it's based on rather old concepts, but they were the first more or less to get it right, in my opinion. So just for the sake of completeness, um, we had even back in 1972, IBM VM 330, uh, 370, um, 3BSD jails in, what was it, 99, and then Solaris Zone. So also um, most of it going in the, in the same direction. So if you compare virtualization, this is your traditional setup. You have your hardware, you have your host operating system, or you have your hypervisor straight on top of it. You have a rather narrow interface here. And the great thing about um, classic hypervisor-based virtualization is you can have your guest OS here, and this can be different from that. And it can be different from your host system. Um, for example, um, Windows and KVM is possible. Um, if you take a look at the container environment, um, this is somewhat similar, but you have problems if you want to um, directly um, run containers or Windows containers on, on Linux, this is not going to work. Um, with virtualization and packaging your, your container runtime into a virtual machine, this somehow works, but um, yeah, this is not what everybody expects the way it works. So to sum it up, virtual machine uh, containers are not virtual machines, they are something completely different. So what's different? Um, compared to VMs, um, Docker separates application from the underlying operating system. 
more or less the, the way um, virtual machines separate the operating system from the underlying hardware. Um, the thing is, when you want to ship an just, just an application doing something, um, the whole stack becomes part of becomes part of the requirement, and Docker just just turns this this fat requirement for VMs into a rather lightweight one. Uh, when you compare um, Docker to other containerizers, um, yeah, um, Docker is, in my opinion, just bringing containers to the masses. Um, the main thing is um, you give them they they brought along the tools and, and workflows around container around the container email, um, engine that it's yeah, just making it easy for everyone to use and um, yeah, a complete ecosystem around it. For example, if you take a look at Docker Hub, but I already mentioned this, but um, I remember when you spoke with, with Wolfgang at, at CBIT and I said, okay, if you're doing containers now and why not LXC? It's been around for, for ages, but I never heard you use this and you said, oh, it's just way too complicated. We looked at it for, for a couple of days and um, Docker is just much simpler. And I, I, in my opinion, that's more or less the way it is. You, you can get started really, really fast um, using Docker containers. So um, if you contain it, there are other solutions around um, the more technical um, ones are systemd um, NS, NSPawn. Um, this is something, yeah, that is located between uh, um, CH root and LXC and it labels itself as um, root on um, steroids. So this is rather something you don't want to use in larger deployments. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is LXC. Um, this is something you usually um, start a complete system with um, besides the kernel and um, you have a running system D and this is something you more or less as a age into it. So Docker is more lightweight or Docker is more focused on, on containerizing the application and not the complete system at this point. Um, another thing is, um, is there's Rocket out there. We talked about this before for a second. Um, Rocket is of all these most comparable, in my opinion, um, to, to, to Docker. Um, I don't see it that frequently used compared to Docker, but this might change over time. They have some, some nice scenarios they're currently um, providing. Um, yeah, containers with a stricter isolation running inside KVM. You can also do this with, with containers, but uh, with, with Docker containers, but not just the way you can do it with, with Rocket, just with a command line and, and start it up. And, but I think um, once anybody has a greater use for this, um, I, I think Docker will be the first to implement this. So why does Docker matter for computing? I don't think um, I should go on about this. Everybody knows here what high performance computing is, but you see I reused the slides. Um, that we do more there than only f putting um, penguins in the, inside the wind tunnel. Um, yeah, HPC sometimes good issues. Um, I'm not focusing on the top 500 scale here. They have other issues than I'm talking about. I'm thinking about <coughs> smaller clusters. Um, say a few hundred a few hundred nodes um, and this is my background my background is not top 500 style it's just smaller but um, yeah we have the, the same sort of system so the, the problem is um, having a clean slate as mentioned before docker does a pretty good job when it comes to isolating different applications um, this is important when you want different um, versions um, no, when you, uh, when you have applications that require different versions of the same library and this, you just cannot script it anymore, um, this is something Docker might help you. Or when you need to run um, legacy applications on a, current, um, on a current operating system, as we've seen with, with the um, Flexel um, license server example, or the other way around, when you have your legacy operating system, you just need to keep running and you want to use new applications. So, or oh, for compa uh, packaging complex software or providing different versions of them alongside each other, um, OpenFOAM is a good example, which is rather complicated to, to build. And I, I think it's the first one, or one of the first to provide um, containers on the download side, but I think I've got a slide on this later. So, um, providing a clean slate for application um, is something um, I really like Docker for. Then. We have the deployment um, thing. Um, I'm not going to go into deep uh, in, in, into detail, but the thing is, um, you can usually um, just just use um, 
yeah, a Docker pull instead of a yum install for, for containers. And um, so this becomes important then um, when you want to reuse um, this um, homogenizing, uh, homogenizing heterogeneous clusters. So um, our customers usually have the thing they have one team who bought this specific hardware and um, he wants to um, use it on a short term from the hardware from, from a different from a different team and you stand there, okay, I just don't want to install several hundred nodes just for um, just for two days. Everything is automated and it works, but um, it's just not something you want to do. Um, if you can more or less clarify your, your HPC cluster and um, or pick the pick um, the, the right image um, at boot time. I think this is something everybody could win from this. And then also passing on your environment. Um, what I already said before with the, with the genome sequencing guys um, who were able to to share their um, to share their pipeline um, for doing their things. Um, I think it's great for this. And as I said, um, we are sharing complicated applications. OpenForm is, is one of the first, um, let's call it ISVs here, um, to, to provide Docker um, just as, as containers. But I, but I think um, over time there are more to follow. Perhaps Wolfgang can show, so I shed some light on this later. So another thing is reproducibility, science. Um, yeah, when packaging the application and, f and freezing the, the complete environment or workflow as a Docker image, you have always the possibility um, to go back in time and use this exact version that you packaged like, I don't know, three years ago. Um, the thing is, you have lots of fields where you need reproducibility. You have run this simulation like a year ago and um, due to some reason you have to rerun it again. In automotive, for, for example, um, due to certification, and um, the thing is, even when when um, when you have your your conservative enterprise um, distribution who says, okay, all our um, APIs are stable on, on the long term, um, this might be not ideal for using this here. And the thing is, um, you usually don't get exact the exact same state as you had like a year ago or something. Um, you would have to, to, to archive any packages and um, document with each job running um, what exact versions of everything he was running. So pack this in inside a container and you're good to go and um, yeah, you can use it again and rerun it um, later in time. So um, sharing this um, or moving, um, getting access um, to, to different resources um, by the use of, of containers is also something which is really great. So, um, yeah, for example, you, you sit on your workstation, you have this container, and you, you now need more power, and you move this to your, to your uh, local cluster, or you might now um, require even more power, and you move this to the cloud, or to, um, to, to your bare metal HPC um, provider. Um, I think, especially for, for, for bare metal HPC providers, if there's still any around, um, using Docker or offering Docker might be a great thing to do um, because it just simplifies the application rollout for them and, and just puts more of a dynamic um, to it. So, well, why not use classical virtualization? Well, um, besides the workflow aspects that it's simpler um, to do, uh, yeah, there are many things around that are easier to do um, with containers um, than to do with virtual machines. Um, this is one thing. Um, performance. Um, performance is superior in many cases. Um, I, brought some, I brought some benchmarks along. The one is the IBM research report um, called an updated performance comparison of virtual machines and Linux containers. And if you haven't read it, I guess you have, um, but just in case you don't, um, you get it here or just type IBM Docker paper into Google and you should find it. Um, the thing they did is um, Want to take a picture? Oh, that's what you put Oh, yeah, thank you. I want to read it and try it. Yeah. Great um, That's what I'm here for. Um, the thing is, what they did is um, they, they compared a setup um, on IBM systems. Um, on the one hand, using bare metal uh, or running um, the, the benchmarks bare metal versus KVM versus Docker. 
and they did a really wide variety of tests with different storage systems, different networking configs. Um, they had as benchmarks, they had Linpack, um, they had random access uh, for memory access time, they uh, benchmarked memory throughput, um, network bandwidth, network latency, block I.O., um, and then as a more real-life um, scenario, they had Redis database and then MySQL. And to sum this up a bit, um, everybody can read for themselves. The thing was, um, what they came out with is that the performance Docker versus KVM um, is, yeah, Docker performs in, in all scenarios usually better than KVM, or, um, and that KVM usually um, goes, goes in, hand in hand with a lot of performance, even yeah, though it has gotten much better over time. Um, yeah. Did they also compare executing these uh, programs on the uh, normal OS? On the what? On the normal bare OS. Bare OS. metal, yes. Bare metal, yeah. They did bare metal versus KVM versus Docker. So how are the, are the comparisons with bare metal? Just give me like two seconds, <laughs> I'll come to this. <laughs> well, you got a business card for the Rattle? Okay, so this counts. <laughs> <laughs> this counts, yes. <laughs> it's the first, first question, so. Okay, so um, Docker versus bare metal. Um, the, the summary is there was very little overhead, um, even though one should be taking aspects like um, yeah, NAT and choosing the right storage um, backend into consideration. So, but it's usually ah, which I've got this here. Um, you have to decide and um, at, at small details, but the performance overhead is rather small. What we also did. At work is um, this was published at closer 2015 or something. Um, it was the idea was to to summarize the benefits of container-based virtualization for HPC and then just add um, a little CAE application. And um, thanks again to Sebastian Klingberg for doing the benchmarks. Um, the the summarize uh, summary is that we lost like two um, two or one percent depending um, of on what we what we use as a storage backend for for scratch space. Yes. Do you did you uh, optimize the user land within, or do you run the same? Ask Sebastian. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I think he did not optimize both. I think it was just the the operating system the way it was installed, and then put Docker onto this and made a container with the same environment oh. as and then. Okay. Was there another question? I just saw a hand over. Okay. Okay. The thing is, you, those those rounds do not really uh, compare with each other. It was not that they were started at the same time or something. We just needed some sort of way to visualize this. So. I was wondering that the native software needs more time than the Docker load. We'll have a look at this later. I yeah, hope I didn't screw see up. that in many cases. So there are in the mean many applications on that. And there is usually plus minus 0.5% differences uh, above and, and, and below. Right? This is, and nobody really knows that. So what are the errors on these, uh, on these numbers? Is this maybe just a, a result of, of noise in, in your runtime management? I think even if it was 1% to 2%, this is something at least the customer I'm dealing with could, could easily live with. No, just for the meaning of these numbers. If, if these differences are significant or not. Not really. No. The graph should be with the base. Yeah, zero I know, and should have error bars and stuff. <laughs> okay, um, what you probably come along in everyday life is something like this. You start up your, your container and do something like echo hello world and it's there and gone in like half a second or something. So the VM to boot up uh, I use on, on, on the MacBook um, which is old and has a broken battery as we learned before. Um, takes like one minute or two minutes to boot up and the container running from inside the VM then just takes like half a second. So, a little bit of security, um, which is m one of the main reasons um, Docker is not that widely accepted. Um, for some users at least, so let's start with a few opinions. Um, these were taken from Surviving the Zombie Apocalypse by Ian Jackson, um, which was a rather interesting talk at 2015's Fostem, um, where he compared um, all the 
yeah, I'm going to go on this later, just start with the, with the opinions. So one of my favorites is this one, um, that from a security standpoint of view, uh, containers are much weaker um, because they are all sh uh, share the same kernel. There's a wider attack surface here and that some users just yeah, make the mistake of, of, of seeing containers as, as a drop-in replacement for virtual machines where everything now is great and it's not. So um, one should be aware of that there are certain pitfalls out there. So um, Jerome um, gave this one um, that containers, virtual machine and machines might be more secure today, but containers are catching up. Um, you should say this as one of the lead developers for Dockers. Um, this one is great from Theo de Raad, um, who is the OpenBSD project lead. He has some rather strong opinions, and um, he just goes on about um, it's it's about it's not about containerization. It's it's about virtualization in general. And he was ranting with the Linux folks, and he said, "Okay, everybody who thinks that KVM and um, whatsoever is secure, um, um, you are sort of deluded, and um, you can't well." The point is, he's, he's right. Um, you can't write any software without any errors. There will always be errors. So the thing is, um, what happens from it? When I, when I had a slide uh, up the last time, I could at least say, OK, they're consequent. They don't offer any uh, hypervisor on their own. But um, yeah, this really has proven me wrong. They, they are working on one. I don't know how secure it is, if it has holes in it. Um, but I guess we'll find out. And a uh, more recent um, saying is from Jerome too, um, that Docker security status is best described as it's complicated. So um, going away from these opinions, um, let's let's speak numbers. Um, and this talk, Ian Jackson um, did some, or for this talk, Ian Jackson did some bean counting with a colleague of his. You can find this all online here. Um, he. The thing is, I think George Dunlop was, was the one to give the talk, and he had the manuscript, and he sat there and read it out loud, and um, so it was easy to catch up again um, afterwards. And the thing is, um, he decided to, to go over all CVEs from 2015 um, for para-virtualized KVM and QML, Linux as general containers, and Linux as app containers. Um, and um, go for the categories privilege escalation from guest to host, denial of service. So you bring down your host system, for example, or um, information leakage um, from the host to the guest system, and um, started counting. So um, what's obvious here is if you want a highly secure virtu uh, virtual uh, virtualization offering, you have to go with Xen and um, para virtualization. Um, if you're using Linux containers as a drop-in replacement, you end up here. This is bad. So this would be, you have full access to the Docker command line, you provide your user, I don't know, SSH into a container or whatsoever, and he can do whatever the hell he likes and, and try whatever he likes. Um, not so good idea. Um, what you perhaps might, especially in the <coughs> HPC environment, have something like this, Linux app containers, where the application is not run in interactively. It just runs, you put some data in it, you get some data out, and I think this is closest to HPC it can get. And if you take a look at the number, it's, it's almost on the same level as KVM and QM. So the technology itself must not be implicitly broken here, I guess. So what is a problem is um, certain misunderstandings. Um, for example, this post here from the lovely Jeff Brazil, um, which was one of the yeah, more core developers at Docker had this blog post where she um, talked about um, how she containerized the desktop application and this was like sandboxing for her. And um, first of all, it's not sandboxing, but we'll go to on, um, I'll go on this later, um, just explain what she did. She, she started, okay, I want my MUT, my mail uh, containerized. Ah, okay, I have to put in my MUT RC that he knows where the server is and so on. Um, then the next step was, oh, okay, I want to use Spotify. Ah, I can't hear sound. Okay, I need to pass on the, the audio devices, then Skype with video and blah, 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 and this built up even more. So a final entry was this. She was able to use Gparted inside a container. Okay, fair thing. Um, what she did is she did um, pass her dev SDA uh, inside the container, and then she could run a containerized Gparted. Okay. 
you can do this, but this definitely is not sandboxing. So um, it's just an uh, issue of careless, uh, carelessness here usually. Um, what was great, it, used, uh, it started lots of discussion. Let's sum this up a bit. Um, first of all, they told her that it's a bad thing to um, use X, X11 in, in comparison um, with containers. Um, you might be um, prone to, to rootkits and so on, and um, you should not run this either. So um, she passes on, uh, she bind mounts her, her root file system, mounts this in, under TMP, starts a container which recursively uh, deletes um, the TMP file system, and then she has lots of space on her local disk, and her sandbox is gone. So um, the reason behind this, why this worked, is um, up until recently, uh, Docker had not support for, for, for user namespaces. So basically, if you were root inside your container, you were root outside your container. And um, now there are user namespaces available, not enabled by default, available. You can turn this on. Um, if you go on a bit further and imagine this in an NFS environment, um, you go on to something like this. You want to use uh, access files from another user. OK, you get a permission denied. But the good thing is, um, yeah, you get his user ID, and um, you have access to the Docker command line interface, and you then just start a container um, under his user ID, and, and off you go. And um, yeah, bad thing. Um, so what to do, how to tame the dragon. Um, first of all, you want sort of fine-grained access to the Docker command line interface. You don't want everybody to be able to access uh, the Docker command line interface and start container, whatever they like. Um, because usually being member of the Docker group can be enough to have some fun. Um, as long as no other security measurements are in place. Um, Yes, um, for example, one could think of limiting access to the containers or, or what um, directories could be passed into. Um, from a complete paperwork um, state of things, um, when you want access, uh, the company I work, uh, work for, when you want access to the Docker command line interface, you have to sign the same exact sheet um, when you want root access on your local machine. So. Um, yeah, in recent, more recent version, um, there's the possibility to use and implement OS plugins, um, which lead to a to role-based access control um, model and so on. Or you use wrapper scripts, um, for example, Zulu scripts limiting users to starting a specific container with specific options, and so on and so on. So if you're trying to use this technology in a, in a containerized, yes? Yeah, so, so uh, just uh, this, uh Jessica Frazell, she also has this bin CTR project. Are mm -hmm. you aware of that? And are you planning to talk bin about CR? it? Bin CTR, so unprivileged uh, containers for unprivileged use where you okay. can put their own binary in. And, uh, what I'm aware of, she was working with the Bain, uh, at the Bain project, which was an, an app, uh, which was an app armor um, configuration configurator or something. Um, I'll have to look at the other one. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, the other thing is to have wrapper scripts um, that not every user can have full access to the command line and just start the container he wants to start and um, just give them access to, to a specific um, defined option. So um, another great thing is um, to use application containers over system containers. This is what I was mentioning before with the slides from Ian Jackson, um, just to, to yeah, reduce the impact the user can have. So um, having direct access into, in a, into a container and using it as a replacement um, for, for, um, for virtual machines is usually a bad thing. So then you usually want your own registry. Um, someone explained Docker once as running code as root, you download it off the internet. Uh, Running, running code as root, you just download it from the internet and um, giving it full access to your local machine. And um, you should at least think about um, creating sort of things, um, your, your own images, and um, being aware of what's inside or sticking to the official Docker images or to the, to the official images available on Docker, to be specific. And um, yeah. You should you should not use or you should not do everything you can can do here. So what's new? Um, what happened in the last half year? 
Um, Docker released several um, several features uh, on security. Um, let me go over this quickly. Um, there's possibility to apply security on different layers. Um, if you take a look here, um, we did um, the work to, well, it's, it's just to, to summarize what technology available yet outside the Docker project or inside the Docker project um, can be applied if you want to use Docker, so not going to something, to some project else or something, or reinventing the wheel and just using, uh, reusing the work some, some others did. So um, we can go on about this later. I think I should stick to the time schedule. Um, then then you have certain features out there. Um, for example, um, there's been a switch um, in, the, in the architecture. Um, we now have run C and container D. So starting with version 1.11, Docker now ships with runtime based on technology um, from the Open Container Initiative, and um, which is yeah, aiming to, um, to standardize container technology. What has changed um, to user? Actually, not really much. Um, he can use the same tools as before. The AP, uh, API and the command line tools have not changed. Under the hood, a lot has changed. Um, yeah, all the work goes towards breaking Docker down in, in smaller components and not having this one blob. And um, yeah, the thing is, um, you want to be able to, um, to have these components interchangeable. And um, the next aim is more or less to improve stability and performance as container D's integration um, comes with a, yeah, came with a massive code cleanup um, at this point. And um, yeah, they say they also found some historic bugs they have now fixed, uh, fixed so which was a good thing. Uh, performance wise, the new setup is not slower, so creating containers should be even faster. That's at least what the blog post said. I haven't had time to try this out myself. So they're hoping for more um, performance optimization to come soon. So um, the thing about run C is um, that's the new executor here. And um, <coughs> yeah, this is the executor bundle with the engine here. And um, the idea is to make this interchangeable. So if you have a, some sort of project or you want to have some, some other technology here um, that you can change, interchange this part with um, yeah, swap out run C for something else, which is more security aware whatsoever, even more performant and so on. That was the idea here. And you could also, I mean, prior to this, you if you want to uh, install a new version of Docker Engine, you had to kill all the containers. And nowadays, since it's not mm. uh, running as a right. child of the Docker Engine anymore, you can just um, reinstall Docker Engine or update Do Docker Engine and then off you go. So it's yeah. not uh, a hard dependency anymore. That's a, that's that's a good run. point. That's also nice. So um, starting with, with version 1.9, Docker now includes um, support for multi-host um, networking um, that works with Swarm and Compose. And this allows the creation of virtual machines and the possibility to attach containers um, to them. So you can create network topology yeah, more or less appropriate um, for your distributed application the way you want. So, um, yeah, the networked um, containers can now span multiple hosts and seamlessly communicate with each other. Um, yeah, and setting up this, that's mine. You can have one. No, sorry. Um, so what was I was saying? Um, so you don't really have to worry anymore on what host system your container lands. So, and there's a new network um, command line interface. I guess we'll skip this. What happened on Docker 2016, which was conveniently in conflict with this conference here. Um, yes. Um, yes? Mostly just mentioning uh, networking. So uh, last time, I think we had a discussion about uh, remote direct memory access, which was not actually possible, I think, in Docker. Is this now? Was there some progress because I, time, I think, uh, I, think I, I think uh, Christian has something about RDMA later. Okay. Yep. So, but if you get the business card for the raffle, I am still. There's one missing too. I, I saw will, him. Yeah, we, I will touch on this. <laughs> later. Yeah, we'll we'll cover this topic later. So, um, what is new? Docker is moving to a more um, app store alternative. They brought out the Docker Store, which is they. They're labeled for, for quality assured containers. That's what the marketing slide says. And uh, it provides security scans. Um, 
they check for the correct usage um, of open source licenses, best practices respected when, when packaging um, payment models um, are also included. Um, the idea is um, that you as a contributor or, or container packager um, upload their, their container on, on this Docker store um, and I don't know, they charge like two dollars or something um, for, for, for your container and um, then you split with Docker Inc. So, um, that was their marketing plan here. Um, this does not replace the Docker Hub. The idea is just to have um, the security scanning, quality assurance, and this stuff integrated and, and paid for. So um, another thing is they now have a um, um, easy cloud integration with, with um, um, Amazon and AWS. Don't ask me on this. I, I just looked up um, the conference finished two days ago or something. and. Um, now they have also support for distributed application bundles and um, a services command where a service is a set of tasks that can be easily replicated and scaled. I think, were you Christian? Were you going to talk about this a bit too? Or do you have yeah. some, 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 some update? Uh, Christian at least has, has some update on what happened on Docker.com too. So yeah. we joined. Right. The main point at DockerCon, more or less for the 1.12 release, was orchestration. So, um, yes, yeah, starting a Docker Swarm has gotten much simpler. You just start your master node with Docker Swarm in it and um, just join the master uh, with, with one Docker Swarm join. Master and then the port 23, um, 37 or something. And it then does all the magic certifica uh, certification. Um, rotation um, and TLS authentication and so on and so forth and um, at least they put some work into this here. So as I'm already a bit over time um, I just think I'll start the part with installing Docker. Everybody should be familiar with this hopefully. If not download Docker Toolbox uh, if you're on a Mac you end up with Kitematic which is um, this, this app store thing and um, command line interface as well. See, that's why I came up with the App Store for containers. It just looks somehow familiar and you're yeah, basically up and running. But don't hurry, we we'll can no. 10 minutes more. Is anybody interested? Otherwise, I just really skip it. So, the conclusion. Um, Docker has a lot to offer, especially yeah, for computing and scientific communities and scientific workflows especially. Um, it's easy, um, easy deployment of application and dependencies is more or less the, the, the core thing to do here. And configuration um, isolation that, that goes along with it is, is really a fun thing to use. And um, this all comes with, with almost no performance loss, performing close to bare metal as we learned before. And, um, all the possibility um, and all you have the possibility to use the same images on all the machines you want. So starting with the laptop or your, your engineer workstation, the cluster, the cloud perhaps, sometime you name it and um, yeah, it's easy to share with other. So um, the, the, the key thing for HPC is um, I, I think this can lead to, to um, for, for smaller installation, uh, can, lead, uh, can lead to a more dynamic um, approach um, when, when you're using the, um, the resources and when you, especially when you have conflicting applications here, uh, requirements here. So for the German people, um, this talk is not completely uh, meant as a, uh, as a voting advertisement. Um, there are some, some, some bad things still out there and not everything is shiny, but I think it's going into the right direction. Um, yeah, what is, what is still missing is really backed support by the ISV. Um, we want further or yeah, still integration in, into traditional queuing systems, uh, systems is not completely there yet. There are several projects on the way. Wolfgang mentioned um, with, with Univa mm -hmm. or something, is doing something. 8.4.0. Eight yeah, okay. Um, so um, LSF had one, um, one very simple integration, <coughs> which was more or less just um, support that you can issue a Docker run command into this and uh, not networked and stuff, um, but it's going there. Um, what we had at the company was, was a proof of concept 
uh, of, for container-based um, high-performance computing integrated in a yeah, really traditional setup here. And um, we use um, Open Lava as a queuing system here. And this is the way it ended up. And um, it, it worked. It was not everything shiny, but mm -hmm. it worked um, to sum it up. So um, I, th I think it, it is, yeah, one should consider um, using, using containers or keeping an eye on using containers in, in HPC environments. So the overall conclusion, virtualization 2.0, no, it's something different in my opinion. It's pretty good for portable deployments, for sharing and uh, reusing of components. It has better performance for computing than classical virtualization. Well, security should be ensured and um, getting started is easy. So, um, one more thing thinking about security. Um, I came uh, across this tweet recently. Um, one was, was trying out a, a kernel exploit um, on Friday afternoon. He said, um, and the idea was on, on his um, bare metal system, ah, get this marker, okay, on his bare metal system, he just ran his exploit and blah, 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 blah. He was rude. So um, what he then did is um, try try this thing out uh, inside a container and he has a security option, had security ops, no new privileges. And he then started the exploit and blah, 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 even more output and he was not root. So you see container technology, especially Docker, must not always be that bad security wise speaking. It's was lots of technologies. You have to be aware of what you're doing and um, well, you should not shoot yourself in the knee at this point. So thank you a lot for your attention. Okay, so do we questions? have any more questions? Yeah, questions for you are the first to choose one of those three. Hmm. You have to fight with the other two, which color you want to have. I'll pick one. Questions? Um, are you aware of other um, performance um, benchmarks besides this IBM paper? Like testing different architectures, different um, parallelization paradigms? There should be because some. There must yeah, be yeah, yeah. Some performance there should be some, some out, but um, it's. To be honest, it's, it's less than I'd expect to. Okay. I think many are, or having many who have rather complex architecture probably fear um, the integration and setting up MPI and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And um, that this might be um, the reason for, for limited benchmarks. So you, if you go out and, and look for, for container benchmarks, you will find lots of these. Um, but um, in, in the real world or, the, or in a large scale HPC environment, I think there's not that much around, at least that I'm aware of. Okay. So, so if you should have resources. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, I was recently at the Cray user group and mm -hmm. there was quite a lot of discussion around containers that should shift through there and that was very interesting. You don't say. <laughs> so there, there's also like a lot of stuff going on there in the very high end about on this. And uh, one thing that was discussed are these you know, providing golden images for the users which have, you know, well-defined, well-organized application stack so they don't do the wrong choices. Mm -hmm. So do you already know of uh, this kind of good golden images for HPC type uh, containers or golden containers? Not really. Okay. But I think um, that's something that the site has to decide yeah. on, right? So that's your environment and then you should, as an operations guy, should provide the golden image. I mean, you cannot... Yeah. I think you should not, or maybe if you won't get it from someone else's yeah. side and then say, okay, that's now our side. Well, yeah, I've been kind of playing on with easy build, just creating easy build, just standard. And that, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, is a good, I, I think I, it's a good approach. But I think they have this approach where they have the base image and um, MPI integrated and blah, 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 and the user just tops his application on top of it. The thing is, we didn't take a look at that because the customers are engineers and they just are focused on the work. They're not yeah, yeah. researchers or something who compile their own code or something. And um, that's why we so far haven't yeah, decided, um, yeah, haven't had a reason to, to have something like this. 
Um, the thing is, um, <coughs> as a provider, you, sh you should decide, are you going to be open that on, on your system everybody is allowed of your crew? Um, yeah, what, what is that you can be both, I mean, you can mm -hmm. allow everything, but then provide some good baselines so that people don't yeah. do the wrong design choices. They don't take the, uh, the standard reference Netflix blast and things like this. I think I think um, this is definitely an approach one should go for. So um, as an operator, provide at least one, one certified um, base image the user can then start from with from blah, 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 my trusted image and then put your stuff on top of it. And um, as an operator, you afterwards have, have always still the possibility to at least scan it, sort of. Uh, well, uh, I have a question for the converse situation. <coughs> How do you deal with third party <coughs> application containers? Mm -hmm. How can you adapt them to your local execution environment? We're currently not using this in production. It's still in the proof of concept phase. But you, you're thinking about um, using um, Third party. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you get your, your application right. as a container um, yeah. and, and then integrate it into your environment. Right. From blah, blah, blah to your own stuff. I think but the, good thing is, but the good thing is that if it's a publicly available container image, then hopefully the Docker file is also publicly yeah. available. So you can just read through how it's packaged and how it's built. And if it's based on Ubuntu or if it's based on Red Hat, then you can just Use this Docker file, adopt it to your needs, and then have the same image container. That's what I do. Right? It's open source, so I don't steal it. I just reuse it, right? So you look up exactly. how it's done by other people, and then you re you use it for your own purpose, and, and you put it on top it. of your and then sharing it, sure. <laughs> and then uh, put it on to on top of your stack. So you can learn a lot from the Docker files someone else has put together for an application. It's a very very nice thing to do. So to that one. So, uh, milder companies now, like uh, Bright Computing, uh, on uh, the system management side, they can uh, uh, manage the containers, hmm? hmm? containers. Uh, on the scheduler side, so program manager like Univa Grid Engine, they just uh, announced in 8.4.0 that uh, they can schedule jobs as well as containers. So this is coming. <coughs> and, uh, uh, it, and it is a task for the middleware layer, basically, to handle that. Yeah, because the problem is, of course, we have a large number of users, and, and uh, it seems that Docker seems to be an easier way to deploy applications oh, than installing them in the scratch. And you have them in your uh, hub, in your repository. Then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you maybe you, you have not only one environment, I think. So you could have a, a testing environment where you can just run containers that you have from, from the outside and then just play around with them and get to know what you really need and then put it on your production or I mean that's maybe not, not for, for big systems that you have a big system for testing and a big system for, for production but I think mm -hmm. it's reasonable to have a little playground where you do not have so much constraints. Sorry, maybe just a, a naive question uh, about Windows. When uh, can I reach my wine over uh, uh, systems in order to containerize uh, Windows application? Yeah, when when Windows on has Linux. Now, yeah, when Windows implements all the syscalls of uh, the Linux kernel, then you can use containers, Linux container on Windows. But that might not I, happen. I think I'd stick with virtual machines. There. Well, it's just and so you can run something. Yeah, yeah. or you can you, you, that you can even run KVM inside of a container, right? Okay. The question the question is how good your, your your application runs with mine. Yeah, that's all of the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I click stop here and then